The subject of this PPN presentation is emission controls for medium-duty gas engines. We're going to look at specific emission control systems, describe how they work, and give you some troubleshooting procedures. The systems we're using to meet federal and state of California emission standards include the thermostatically controlled air cleaner, or Thermac, early fuel evaporation, EFE, positive crankcase ventilation, PCV, evaporation control system, ECS, throttle return control, TRC, air injector reactor, AIR, and exhaust gas recirculation, EGR. Carburetor calibration and distributor calibration are also very critical factors in exhaust emission control. In fact, all of these systems are designed to work together to provide the best combination of performance and fuel economy while at the same time controlling emissions. The three chemical compounds which come under federal and state of California regulation are HC, unburned hydrocarbons, CO, carbon monoxide, and NOx, oxides of nitrogen, or NOx. This chart in your reference manual can be helpful in diagnosing problems related to emissions. It shows the most common causes of excessive exhaust emissions. Before we begin, however, you should be aware that both under hood and under vehicle temperatures are appreciably hotter during normal operation, an unavoidable consequence of added emission controls. In fact, under loaded operating conditions, the exhaust manifolds can become glowing hot. To handle the higher temperatures, all V8 exhaust manifolds are stainless steel. It has also made it necessary to protect certain components with heat shields. The largest are used on mufflers. There should be an air gap of at least one inch between the muffler and the shield for it to perform most effectively. Heat shields with an air gap are used on exhaust pipes and on hydraulic brake lines. These shields not only block heat from reaching various components, they also direct airflow to carry heat away from underneath the truck. Starters and fuel pumps, too, are protected from excessive heat. It's important that heat shields should always remain in place and be in good condition. Without them, performance of these components could be affected. Another thing to keep in mind is that because emission controls on the whole have a notable impact on drivability and performance, there are certain adjustments and settings that must be made with absolute precision. One is carburetor calibration. Adjustments to the idle, off-idle, main metering, power enrichment, and accelerator pump systems must be made to factory specs to ensure that exhaust emissions remain within limits. Similarly, distributor calibration is an important part of emission control. Ignition timing, centrifugal spark advance, and vacuum advance settings must be adjusted to precise values shown on the tune-up label and in the service manual. Emission controls are much the same for all medium-duty truck gas engines. The location of some components may differ. Check your reference manual or service manual for this information. Now let's give each of these systems a closer look. The thermostatically controlled air cleaner, or Thermac, provides preheated air to the carburetor. Preheating of inlet air allows leaner carburetor and choke settings. This results in lower emission levels while maintaining good drivability, particularly in cold weather. A damper door in the air cleaner inlet controls the mixing of outside and preheated air. Warmed air is drawn from an exhaust manifold heat stove. The damper door is linked to a vacuum motor, which in turn is controlled by a bimetal temperature sensor mounted inside the air cleaner. A vacuum bleed valve is built into the sensor. When the engine is off, the damper door should be positioned so the inlet is open to outside air and the heat stove passage is closed. When the engine is started cold, the damper door should reverse position, closing the inlet to outside air and opening the passage to the heat stove. As the engine warms up, 
the damper door should slowly reverse position again, shutting off the heated air and allowing outside air to enter the air cleaner. The thermal operating modes and temperature ranges are listed in your reference manual. Leaks in the vacuum lines, the temperature sensor, the vacuum motor itself, or an inoperative vacuum motor can result in too much cold air entering the carburetor, causing stumbling, hesitation, and generally poor cold start performance. In the event the damper door sticks or seizes in the closed position, you could have engine overheating or spark knock. If you suspect a problem, visually inspect the operation of the damper door. Use a mirror if necessary. It should be fully open with the engine off, closing when the engine is started cold, and opening gradually again as it warms. If this doesn't happen, disconnect the vacuum line from the vacuum motor and apply vacuum from an outside source. The damper door should close all the way and stay closed when you trap the vacuum. Other diagnostic and service procedures can be found in the reference manual. Another system entirely separate from Thermac but closely related in function is the Early Fuel Evaporation or EFE system. EFE works with Thermac to provide a heated air fuel mixture during engine warm-up. Again, this reduces the length of time that carburetor choking is required, thereby reducing emissions. You may remember the old thermostatically spring-controlled manifold heat control valve used on the 292 six-cylinder engine. EFE replaces that component. Instead of a thermostat, EFE is controlled by a thermal vacuum switch. When the engine is cold, the thermal vacuum switch is open, allowing vacuum to be applied to the actuator. This causes the damper valve in the exhaust pipe to close which heats up a section of the intake manifold below the carburetor. As the engine warms up to about 105 degrees, the thermal vacuum switch closes, cutting off vacuum to the actuator. This causes the damper valve to open. Exhaust gas flows directly out the exhaust pipe and everything functions normally. If the damper valve sticks closed or vacuum is not cut off after engine warm-up, performance will suffer and there's a possibility of overheating and detonation. If the opposite should occur and there's no heating of intake air, the engine may stumble or stall during warm-up. The next system we're going to look at is positive crankcase ventilation or PCV, a familiar piece of hardware for most technicians. Its main function is to reduce emissions by recirculating crankcase vapors back into the intake manifold. A secondary function is to scavenge blow-by gases from the crankcase, which reduces lube oil contamination, thereby helping to extend engine life. The PCV is a flow control valve. The rate of flow is dependent on manifold vacuum. When vacuum is high, as at closed throttle, Flow is restricted to maintain a smooth idle. At wide open throttle, the PCV is wide open to permit free air circulation. A vent hose from the air cleaner to a valve cover supplies clean, fresh air to the crankcase for scavenging. An inoperative PCV system can cause rough idle, engine stalling, even oil leaks. Fortunately, testing is a simple matter. Remove the PCV valve from the rocker arm cover and run the engine at idle speed. Place your thumb over the end of the valve and check for vacuum. If there is no vacuum, check to see if the vent hose, manifold port, or the valve itself is clogged with oil or sludge. Replace any of these if they are. You can check the function of the PCV valve by removing it from the vehicle completely and giving it a shake. If you can't hear the needle rattle inside, replace the valve. The next system we're going to look at is the Evaporation Control System, or ECS. ECS prevents the escape of fuel vapors from the fuel tanks and carburetor float bowl into the atmosphere. 
The system includes special fuel tank components, carbon canisters for storage of fuel vapors, and electronically controlled purge valves which route the vapor into the intake system when the engine is operating. Pressure vacuum relief valves on all fuel tanks guard against excessive internal pressure or vacuum. The valve allows air into the tank as it cools or as fuel is used and will open to relieve any excessive internal pressure buildup. These tanks also use a special filler cap. If you must replace one for any reason, be sure to replace it with a GM cap with the same part number. Failure to use the correct cap could result in a serious malfunction of the system. Fuel vapor from the tanks collects in a 2500 cc carbon canister. Vapor from the carburetor float bowl is routed to a smaller 1500 cc carbon canister. In addition, on V8 engines, vapor from the induction system is absorbed by a carbon element in the air cleaner. This vapor is drawn directly into the engine on initial startup. An engine governor purge controller module mounted on the back left side of the instrument panel controls purging of the canisters. Besides the controller, the purge control circuit includes two purge control valves mounted together in the front of the engine compartment, a vacuum control switch and relay mounted on the cowl, and a thermal override switch located in the thermostat housing. The purge control circuit controls canister purge according to engine speed, temperature, and manifold vacuum. The controller module sends a ground signal to the vacuum control switch when engine RPM reaches 2250 RPM after initial startup and 1825 RPM thereafter. The vacuum control switch will be closed if vacuum is 19 inches of mercury or less. The signal is then sent on to the thermal override switch. If engine temp is above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the ground signal then goes on to the relay. The relay then opens the purge valves and canister purging takes place. Vapor is drawn into the engine through a port in the EGR adapter plate. If the system is not purging, you could have an inoperative purge control valve. To check it, apply 12 volts to the suspected valve and see if it is possible to blow air through either port. The valve should be open, permitting the passage of air through either port. Fuel starvation can be caused by an inoperative pressure vacuum relief valve. You can check its operation by applying pressure and vacuum from an outside source. Fuel starvation can also be caused by an inoperative carburetor canister control valve. Make sure that vacuum is applied to this valve and that it closes when the engine is running at operating temperature. A malfunction of this valve can also cause a rough engine at idle and at cruise. The next system we're going to look at is the throttle return control or TRC. It's used on all 6 and 7 liter V8s and the 5.7 liter California engine. Its function is to slow the rate of throttle closing when the accelerator is released. This action helps reduce the level of hydrocarbon emissions during deceleration. There are three main components. The throttle lever actuator, a solenoid vacuum control valve, and an electronic engine speed sensor which is a part of the governor controller module. When vacuum is applied to the actuator, the actuator plunger extends holding the throttle plates a preset amount above the curb idle setting. The solenoid vacuum control valve allows vacuum to be applied to the actuator as long as engine speed exceeds a preset figure. You've probably already figured out that the solenoid valve gets its signal from the governor controller speed sensor. It's calibrated to send out a continuous signal at 1825 engine RPM or higher. You can check the TRC system by observing the position of the actuator plunger at different engine speeds. 
using a tachometer, accelerate the engine to 1890 RPM. The plunger should be extended at this speed. Now reduce engine speed to 1700 RPM. The plunger should retract. If the actuator does not appear to be working, you can quickly check it out. Simply apply 20 inches of vacuum with a vacuum pump and see if it makes the plunger extend. If it doesn't, or if the gauge reading drops, replace it. If it does, and the vacuum gauge holds, then the problem lies with some other component. If the actuator operates outside the speed range, then the electronic speed sensor is at fault and should be replaced. If the actuator does not operate at any speed, check for voltage at the solenoid valve and at the electronic speed sensor. The reading should be 12 to 14 volts at both the solenoid valve and the electronic speed sensor. The reference manual contains additional checks if the solenoid valve and the speed sensor are not reading 12 to 14 volts. And remember, when making any carburetor adjustment, check calibration settings. Be sure to set idle speed to the specification shown on the emissions control information label. The next emissions control system we're going to examine is the air injector reactor or AIR system. The system consists of belt driven air pumps which pump air through a diverter valve and air pipes into the exhaust manifold. Check valves prevent backflow of exhaust into the pump in the event of an exhaust backfire or pump drive belt failure. The diverter valve's main function is to prevent backfiring and excessive exhaust manifold heat when decelerating by diverting the airflow from the exhaust manifold to the air cleaner or to the atmosphere through a silencer. The valve has a combination electronic and vacuum control except for California engines which are controlled solely by vacuum. During deceleration, a high manifold vacuum signal causes the valve to divert the airflow to the atmosphere. The electronic control module will de-energize the solenoid, diverting airflow away from the exhaust manifold when there is high engine RPM over a prolonged period. This prevents heat in the exhaust system from reaching too high a level, which could cause the stainless steel exhaust manifolds to melt. If a malfunction should occur in the control module, solenoid, or wiring harness, the solenoid will be de-energized, and an instrument panel service engine soon on trucks or check engine on school buses light will come on. There is an uncomplicated way to test a solenoid diverter valve. Just squeeze the hoses after starting the engine. Air should be going to the air cleaner or silencer and you should be able to feel the hoses pulsating. Then crack the throttle. The pulsations should now go to the exhaust manifold. The last emission control system we're going to examine is exhaust gas recirculation or EGR. The EGR system meters exhaust gas into the induction system for recirculation through the combustion cycle. This reduces combustion temperatures to less than 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, which in turn helps to reduce oxides of nitrogen in the exhaust. The EGR valve is closed at engine idle and during deceleration. This is to avoid rough idle due to excessive dilution of the air-fuel mixture. Valve opening depends on the amount of vacuum received from a ported source on the carburetor. A thermal vacuum switch allows the ported vacuum signal to reach the EGR valve only after the engine has reached operating temperature. To check the operation of the valve, push on the diaphragm plate. Use caution as the plate may be hot. It should move freely from opened to closed position. To check further, with the engine idling at operating temperature, apply vacuum to the valve. The plate should move upward to the open position. This should be accompanied by a decrease in engine speed. The engine may even stall. Now remove the vacuum. 
the valve should close and engine speed should increase. If engine speed does not change in either case, you'll have to check the intake manifold passages for obstructions. You can check the valve itself either on the engine or removed. Depress the valve diaphragm. Then hold your finger over the vacuum port and release the diaphragm. The valve is good if it takes more than 20 seconds for the diaphragm to move to the closed position. All medium duty gas engines use GM's high energy ignition system. The ignition timing, centrifugal advance and vacuum advance if used, are calibrated to provide the best performance and fuel economy while staying within exhaust emission limits. A note of caution here. Pre-emission distributors built prior to January 1st, 1985 cannot be used on engines built after that date or damage to the engine could occur. When setting the ignition timing, don't pierce the plug lead. Use an adapter between the number one spark plug and the plug wire or use an inductive type pickup. If the cable insulation is broken, voltage will jump to the nearest ground. Handle all spark plug wires with care. Don't pull on the plug wire to remove it. Pull on the boot or use a tool designed for this purpose. That completes our review of emission controls for medium duty gas engines. As always, you'll find more detailed instructions for diagnosis and repair of all these systems in the reference manual that accompanies this videotape. The difficult or challenging thing about servicing emission controls is that similar symptoms can be caused by entirely different systems. And it's not uncommon to have to run a check on every component in a system before a cause can be isolated. In the reference manual, we've included symptom-oriented diagnostic tables and step-by-step -step procedures. Be sure to spend some time reviewing this book after viewing this tape. Remember, once you understand the systems, what can go wrong and how to test them, you can meet the challenge of servicing emission controls on medium-duty gas engines.